video is brought to you by Mubi. Try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash Sarah That's M-U-B-I dot com slash Sarah for a whole month of great cinema for free. The nature of online platforms has shaped the way we interact in striking and often profoundly bizarre ways. While it would be extremely untoward to walk up to a stranger on the street and playfully insult them, demand their opinions on various controversial issues, or join in on a conversation they're having with a friend, online platforms have, at least to some degree, normalized these behaviors. And not just towards public figures, either. The online world has created an entirely new sphere of social interactions with new rules and boundaries, and it seems like we aren't really sure how we should be navigating it yet. This is particularly interesting because social media has hastened the spread of sociological concepts that describe various troubling phenomena. Although terms like emotional labor and gaslighting and trigger have existed for quite some time, it's only been in the past few years that they've taken up mainstream usage on platforms like Twitter, Tumblr, and Reddit. And when these concepts factor into the still unanswered question of how we should set boundaries online, things can get extra complicated. If a friend is struggling and you're talking them through it, is that emotional labor? Is it therefore a violation of consent to vent to your friend without asking them first? Attempts to answer this question have been a little bit messy at times. About a month ago, we saw an explosion of proposed templates for social interactions with your friends. Phrases like, are you in the right headspace to receive information that could possibly hurt you cropped up in response to this idea that we have a problem with boundaries when it comes to hanging out with our friends online. In effect, the argument seems to be that when we're not receiving consent before dumping a lot of heavy stuff on our friends, we're violating their boundaries, enabling toxic friendships, and forcing them to perform emotional labor. Similarly, other users drafted template responses that folks could use to say no when a friend asks to vent to you with phrases like, I'm actually at my emotional capacity. Of course, as soon as this template trend took off, its mockery took off ten times as potently. People were quick to argue that using these kinds of templates makes you sound like a cold robot who doesn't care about your friends, that supporting your friends isn't what the term emotional labor is supposed to mean, and that messages like that disguise sociopathy as self-care. The template issue, while particularly contentious, quickly fizzled out, but there wasn't a real resolution to the debate, and most of the questions it raised remain unanswered. This is going to be the first of a two-part video about how we navigate boundaries online. There are two main types of interactions I think have been impacted in interesting ways by online communication. There's how we interact with our friends, and how we interact with strangers. In this video, I'm going to talk about those friend interactions and how boundary setting with friends has been shaped by the online sphere. So, first of all, what's up with friendship and emotional labor? One of the most interesting changes that comes with social media is that unlike in the past when we only had home phones, most of us are able to be reached at virtually any time. I remember before I had a cell phone when I used to go out, people wouldn't really be able to reach me. And then I remember before I had a phone that was built for texting, people could call me, but people mostly wouldn't unless it was really important. But now, my friends and family can reach me at virtually any time if they really need to. And this is often a good thing. I like hearing from my friends, and being able to share snippets of my day with people I care about is important to me. But the expectation of constant communication can also make things difficult in certain contexts. Because while I love replying to my friends' messages, this constant availability now means if I don't reply for a while, people might think something's wrong. I mean, some people even set up automatic text replies when they're driving so that people who don't receive an immediate reply can understand why. And the idea that people have to reply to messages instantly unless they have a reason not to has certainly created issues in some social interactions. Like, what happens when you suddenly receive a really heavy message from someone and you're in the middle of something really stressful yourself? Debates about how to handle stuff like this have started to crop up, and the term emotional labor has become particularly popular. The term's been used a lot on Twitter to refer to the work we do emotionally in relationships with our friends and partners. For example, our friend comes to us crying and we spend hours with them trying to make them feel better. Some people have described the work we do here to be encouraging and supportive and keep your own feelings contained as a form of labor. This, unsurprisingly, has been contentious, with some people claiming it's shitty to equate being a good friend with doing work. Some analysis has also suggested that this entire mentality just happens because of capitalism. A system that prioritizes constantly growing profits can make any interaction seem like some sort of transaction. So think about posting funny content on the internet. Something that could just be fun interactions with your friends are now constantly encouraged to be monetized. This isn't necessarily always a bad thing in every context, it's great that people can make a living off their creativity, 
but it is true that there can be a trend of pretty much everything you do feeling like a transaction. Some people have therefore argued that using the term labor to refer to interactions with your friends is just capitalist brain rot that makes you see all of your relationships as transactional. There's also a significant subset of the emotional labor arguments that describe it not only as an individual issue in relationships, but also as an issue that's divided across racial and gender lines. So for example, if a husband and wife both have jobs and supposedly do equal housework, but the wife is the one who always keeps track of who does what and has to remind her husband what tasks to do, that can also take up significant mental energy, and some people have described that practice as emotional labor. And if nine times out of 10, it's the wife who has to do this labor and it's not really acknowledged, that's kind of a problem. Or if someone you know says something racist or sexist that impacts you and you have to explain to them why that's the case, those conversations can be mentally exhausting, especially when they last a really long time and you have to have conversations like that with different people often. In effect, people have started to use the term to describe emotional interactions and interpersonal relationships that feel like work and have argued that it often impacts marginalized groups more often than others. Though these do describe real issues, the conflation of those problems with the term emotional labor is somewhat of a new one. The term actually has a different meaning than how it's commonly used, and by using the wrong word for these other issues, we might be making it harder to talk about what emotional labor actually is. So the term was coined by sociologist Arlie Hochschild to describe how workers in many jobs are forced not only to do the expected requirements of their jobs, but also to manage and regulate their emotions in ways that often don't get discussed. So for example, you might think the job description of a Starbucks worker is just to make coffee and heat up baking items and misspell people's names on cups, but actually your job also involves a lot of regulating your emotions to make them palatable to customers and your employers. So if you have a chronic pain condition and you're talking to customers, you're not supposed to show it or seem unhappy. You're supposed to perform joy for them. If you're getting yelled at and called horrible names because you won't take a customer's expired coupon, you're often not allowed to appear angry about it. On the whole, you're expected to appear unfailingly happy, polite, and sociable regardless of how you're feeling, and you're expected to make it seem like your emotions are completely genuine all the time. Not only do you have to smile, you have to smile authentically so customers don't feel lied to. I mean, just look at this description from a Starbucks job posting in Quebec. Baristas personally connect and create moments that make a difference and work together to create a welcoming store environment. Like, what the hell? That's ridiculous! Of course you're not going to be personally connecting with all the people who come into your store for an expensive mocha. You're creating coffee, not moments. But because the expectation in so many work environments is that employees constantly appear authentically happy and create beautiful moments of genuine human connection with every person who enters a shop's doors, workers have these bizarre expectations placed upon them. And that's genuinely exhausting to constantly maintain, especially when you consider how terrible some customers are. You know when you have a relative you hate and you have to spend time with them and you have to smile politely and not show a single negative emotion all the while you're dying inside? Imagine doing that all the time and if you don't, you lose your job. Of course, Starbucks was just an example and this is a thing in all kinds of work environments but it's particularly prevalent in service and caretaking jobs. So teachers, doctors and nurses, wait staff, and similar workers in particular not only have to do the job part of their job, but also have to constantly manage their emotions as well. And a lot of the aforementioned jobs tend to mostly be done by women. So when topics like this start to be discussed, people often talk about emotional labor as something with a gendered element to it. I think this point here is what has most often caused confusion and brought this term into this mainstream, bizarre discourse. So we hear that emotional labor is a thing, and we hear that it especially tends to impact people who are already marginalized. Meanwhile, people are rightfully talking about the mental load that unbalanced social interactions can create. The term emotional labor, if one didn't know better, could kind of sound like a term describing anything a person has to do mentally that sounds like work. And I think this is where we get takes like asking a friend to explain something to you is forcing her to do emotional labor. In actuality, that's not the case because that's not what emotional labor means. It's not just meant to describe anything emotionally exhausting, it's specifically about, well, labor. So, I mean, that fairly well answers the question of are you doing emotional labor when your friends vent to you? The answer is no. But while I don't think that's the term people should be using to describe the issue, I don't think that's the real question. Despite the fact that the wording is wrong, I think what people are really asking when they talk about the issue isn't, does this fit the definition of emotional labor, it's, is this a form of work that it's bad to expect people to do? And that's a more complicated question than simply a matter of definitions. 
So from here on out, for clarity, when we talk about these interactions and templates to say no to these interactions, I'm going to try to use the less common phrase, emotion work, instead. Unlike emotional labor, emotion work specifically refers to managing your own and other people's feelings and the work that goes into managing relationships. So what's up with those boundaries? Most new seeming interactions that crop up online aren't, I think, the result of the internet changing some fundamental nature about how we behave. It allows us to connect with one another faster and on a much larger scale than we used to in the past, ergo most online interactions are simply faster and larger scale versions of interactions we've kind of always had. One of my favorite iterations of this is this webpage from some history professor where it just details translated graffiti from ancient Rome. It's all stuff like, my girlfriend left me, this person likes this person, the service here is terrible, and dirty jokes, and it reads like a message board today. So I think in a lot of ways it hasn't fully changed how we interact, but just how quickly we interact and who we interact with. But I absolutely do think this expectation of constant availability genuinely has shaped the way we experience relationships with each other. It's permeated all aspects of life, from people's jobs to their friendships. Because people constantly have their phones and computers on them, they're often expected to be available for contact 24-7. It's gotten so bad that France has actually had to specifically grant employees the right to ignore work emails after 6pm, because otherwise you're basically on call all the time. Naturally, a lot of times when this critique of constant availability is leveled, it tends to be leveled to refer to the kind of labor we're doing at work. Of course it's not healthy to be expected to be contactable by your boss literally all the time. You probably don't even like your boss, and if you don't have a life outside work, you may barely have a life. But much like people have used a term describing paid work to describe the work we do in friendships, this might also refer to constant availability in terms of interpersonal relationships. Think back to what I said earlier about people setting up an automated text reply for when they're driving. I mean, you can't even just not reply for the amount of time it takes you to drive somewhere without having to justify to people why you're not available to them. And in interpersonal relationships, that can sometimes be hard. Not because you don't like your friends, but because having time to yourself is healthy as well. Being able to take time for yourself without feeling as though you're betraying anyone who might possibly want to talk to you is fairly important. The reason I say this is not to go on some alarmist rant about how technology and cell phones are dangerous and are destroying the fabrics of relationships and of society. Of course, being able to contact your friends and family even when you're apart has a lot of benefits as well. Sometimes you need support or want to make plans with someone, and it's just nice to have the comfort of knowing your friends are there when you are. Many of my friends live all over the world, and we can't see each other in person that often. It makes our friendships feel real and alive when I can message my friend in Armenia and hear back just like that. It's amazing. But it's also true that there are negatives to the expectation that as long as you have your phone on you, that means you're available to contact no matter what, and if you aren't for any period of time, that's something you immediately have to justify. And I think that's part of why we're seeing tweets suggesting templates for how to reply to a friend when we're struggling, but you aren't always able to drop everything and talk to them. Because as awkwardly robotic as those specific templates ended up being, there is truth to the fact that sometimes when a friend comes to you and tells you they want to vent about something, you aren't always going to be able to reply in real time. Maybe you're going through a crisis yourself, or helping someone else, or you simply need your own time. I'm actually at my emotional capacity definitely sounds like a funny response in certain contexts, but in some contexts it can absolutely be a real thing. I think so many of us care about our friends so deeply that we always want to be able to help them through anything and fix all their problems, and there are many situations where that's just not possible. I have a lot of friends online who are going through really difficult stuff in their personal lives that I can't fix, and it's often a source of stress for me. I can provide emotional support, but I can't literally go in there and solve their problems, and I hate that. And sometimes I find myself so disturbed by the fact that I can't save my friends from their problems that I drive myself crazy, and that doesn't help them either. It's really good and really necessary to be there for our friends, but when we take no time to take care of ourselves in the process, we can be stretched so thin that we can't help them or ourselves. Of course, there are always going to be people who take stuff like that in bad faith by taking it to an extreme. There are people who will constantly ignore their friends in times of need and frame it as self-care. And of course, that's wrong too, and I think that's where a lot of concern over those text templates comes from. It's pretty worrying to think that if you need help, your friends will simply rebuff you if they're having a slightly bad day. But with social media creating a sense of constant availability, there does exist this idea that if you aren't able to support your friend through anything at any moment, you're being a bad friend. 
So while those specific templates certainly didn't come off well, the principle behind it isn't based on nothing. It's also worth mentioning that a lot of those responses are context dependent. Not everybody is always going to be able to be in the emotional state to send out a chipper, hey, is it okay if I vent for a couple moments? And real interactions are often a lot messier than those Twitter templates make them out to be. When these templates are accompanied by absolutist messages like, you should never vent to your friend without asking for permission first or you're a toxic person, or when responses have messages like, if you aren't willing to drop everything for your friends at any time, you're not a real friend, they ignore a lot of nuance. Different situations will always necessitate different responses, and the same is true for different people. Think about that message that's like, are you in the right headspace to receive information that could possibly hurt you? For many people, that's probably not going to be a very useful thing to hear. They already know something is wrong, so a lot of people are just going to be worrying about what it could be and imagining the worst. On the other hand, that might be a beneficial thing for some people to hear. For some people, if you know bad news is coming, you might be able to excuse yourself from whatever it is you're doing, maybe get some rest, and then come back to hear what's going on. <laughs> I am not one of those people. But I'm also not going to presume they don't exist. That being said, I don't mean to say that just because templates don't work for every context and person, no one should use them ever. Another interesting critique explaining why some people might use those templates is that for a lot of people, it's hard to say the right thing to someone who's struggling, especially if you aren't sure how to help them. And for some people, especially if you're autistic or simply overwhelmed, having a response already written out that you can use to express your feelings in an understandable way can be really helpful. I think this is a really fair point, and while I don't think it's a good defense of every template, starting a message to someone in crisis with, hey, I'm so glad you reached out, does not come off well, it does acknowledge that having a pre-written response to something doesn't mean you don't personally care about your friend. Truthfully, I do think the fact that people got so angry about these templates on Twitter is simply because the phrasing was awkward and stilted rather than the actual content. Although many of them suggested you should customize them to your needs, you probably don't want to come off as a customer service representative when your friend is going through it. Using templates is necessary for some people, but maybe we should be writing better ones. Despite some very awkward framing on Twitter, emotional capacity and emotion work are real things, and I think we should all take care to make sure we're looking after ourselves so that we're equipped to help our friends. Sometimes that might mean saying, I'm really overwhelmed right now, are we able to talk a bit later? That in and of itself doesn't mean you don't care about your friends, and being on 24-hour call to instantly reply to every message isn't a realistic or healthy expectation for most people. But of course, that doesn't mean we have no obligation to support our friends. Ultimately, a lot of these situations are genuinely context-dependent. It's wrong to say you're a bad friend if you aren't always reachable, and it's wrong to say you're a bad friend if you don't always ask before venting. Truthfully, Twitter is kind of bad at nuance, and we should probably all just move to LiveJournal or whatever. I also think, on the whole, despite the fact that many people misuse the term emotional labor, the fact that the same critiques we apply to our work environments are now also being applied to our personal relationships is really interesting. To me, this suggests that the most toxic elements of harmful work cultures have become so prevalent that they're seeping into other aspects of our lives. When you're expected to be available to your boss 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you're being stretched so thin that it's even harder to be available to your friends for that same amount of time. When you spend all your time at work pretending to be happy to make a customer's day marginally more magical, it's even harder to come home and appear strong for a friend that needs it. Truthfully, terrible jobs make the rest of our lives terrible too. I also think that's a big reason why the term emotional labor took off the way it did. When paid labor is demanding so much from us on the emotional side of things, it can be hard to manage those emotions in a personal context as well. I think this is a case not just of confused terminology, but also of trying to analyze how we're all impacted by technology and capitalism. The wording might be off, but emotional labor and emotion work can and do affect each other. Whether or not interpersonal relationships count as labor, I think one fact that's obvious is that the way actual labor is treated in society is deeply concerning. Whether it's forcing workers to swallow any sign of discomfort to appear authentically happy all the time, to the fact that when people are unable to work they're often consigned to horrific poverty even if they get assistance, the culture of both social interactions and actual paid interactions is particularly concerning, and these two things are fundamentally tied together. So I think it's worth saying, when workers come together and form unions and fight back against these conditions, it can make a difference for generations to come. It's the reason many of us have an eight-hour work week.
So if you're working and you're not unionized, I would encourage people watching this to think about joining or creating one. It's not always easy to do so, especially when employers have a vested interest in making sure people who work don't come together and advocate for themselves. I've put some resources in my description for people who want to learn more about unions and how to start them. Keep in mind, I do live in Canada and the resources I've chosen are based on what I know and aren't necessarily going to be generalizable to the laws and work cultures of every country. I do hope they're a starting point for some people nevertheless. I watched this really good film on movie called I, Daniel Blake. It's a British movie about a man living in Newcastle who becomes sick and can't work, and it's this story about how the systems we have right now are really failing to support the most vulnerable people in society. It's a really powerful story, and I'm very glad I watched the film. It's a fictitious story, but it's a really good and really real watch. It's one of the reasons I'm really glad Movie is my sponsor for this video, because it gave me an opportunity both to watch the film and to share with others. I would really recommend it for anyone who wants to watch a powerful film that tells an impactful story about how people in society should be better working to support one another. If you'd like to watch this movie or any other of the films Movie has available, you can use my promo code, which is movie.com slash for a month of great cinema for free. Basically, the way Movie works is that it's a streaming service for really good films that are hard to find elsewhere. So there are a lot of amazing foreign films, films that were acclaimed at festivals, and lesser known films by the makers of cult classics. Every day the site swaps out one movie, so you get a new movie every single day, and there's always a month's worth of movies available every single time. It's basically like being at a film festival that never ends, and also you don't have to leave your bed, so it's like a film festival except better in every conceivable way. Again, you can try a month of movie free at movie.com slash sarahz, so m-u-b-i dot com slash sarahz. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to specially thank Adam Granger and Thomas P. Tecock for joining my $20 plus tier.